Hey everybody, Adam from Passable Media here. This is the weekly Arrowverse roundup for the week commencing March 18th, 2019. Yes, perhaps it's not right to call this segment weekly at the moment, since I've somehow fallen several weeks behind. I'm going to change up the way I record these, since at the moment I'm writing out gargantuan 45 minute long scripts and then struggling to read and edit them in any kind of reasonable time frame. So instead I'm going to try and be a bit less story point by point focused and a bit more off the cuff, and maybe less stringent in my editing, but we'll see how long that lasts. Let's see how it goes with our last stacked week for a while. Supergirl Season 4 Episode 15, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? This week we are introduced to the Arrowverse version of Lex Luthor and it is glorious. Honestly, it is no exaggeration to say that John Cryer's Lex Luthor is the best thing to ever happen to the entire series, and one of the best things in the Arrowverse overall. He's a hell of a presence, commanding every scene he's in right off the bat, as Lex Luthor should, and he brings along a whole host of twists and turns with him that has, for me at least, breathed some new life into Supergirl. Here's hoping he's around for a while, but also not long enough to become stale. Lex right from the get-go is properly chilling. He's clearly a bad guy who's a fair bit along in his villainy arc by the time we pick up with him and Lena in the four years earlier flashback at the start of the episode, where he had Metropolis under siege with a red sun. When the pair meet back up, he's almost sweet by comparison and we start to learn that Lena and Lex have been working together for some time. Throughout his introduction episode, we see him go from seemingly loving brother to out and out sociopath. He is completely willing to stomp all over everybody in order to get what he wants, and as we discover, and as I've already said I was expecting, he's the one who arranged for James to be shot. It's a revelation that completely pulls Lena out of her returning affections for Lex, as she realises once again in her life that the Luthers only know how to use and abuse their loved ones. So Lex tricked Lena into finishing the serum and testing it out on James, thereby healing him solely to give him the superpowers that he's always wanted. And it has the handy bonus of fixing the cancer that's been not so slowly killing him. Lena's biggest mistake wasn't necessarily even trusting Lex, it was just the leaving him alone with the Haranel formula, since it meant that Otis Graves disguised with an image inducer could give it to him in her absence. Oh, and in a shock twist that I'm perfectly willing to accept that I didn't see coming, Eva's been evil all along. And she shot James. Holy shit. Have some betrayal. Lex murders a goddamn army of Department of Justice fellas using the house's defences, and the episode ends with Lex and Kara facing off and Lex greeting her hello. The Manchester side story finally comes to a head, with John killing him after a series of events relating to, oh, I don't know, desecrating his father's grave and stealing his people's most prized possession. The dude had it coming. And this means that Brainy will eventually get his ring back, once John gets over himself at least. Oh, and also Brainy and Nia kiss, but Brainy decides that no relationship of theirs would ever work out well, because reasons, undefined reasons. I gotta say, I love this episode, well, the Lex Luthor based stuff at least. Supergirl's been on an unprecedented roll in the last two weeks, and I truly hope it continues. Arrow Season 7, Episode 16, Star City 2040. We have a montage of Mia's birth and early life, including a training session implied to be one of many with Nyssa, no less, leading up to her leaving for Star City after discovering that Felicity is still working as a vigilante in secret, having taken up her father's identity as the Calculator. Mia gets caught sneaking into Galaxy 1 with William, but is covered for by Connor Hawk. Oh, and hey, sideline here, because I missed this last episode, but Connor Hawk is Ben Turner's kid, having been adopted by John and Lila at some point. And here it turns out that he works for Nightwatch, which he calls the good version of Argus, maybe referring to the whole evil Argus story from Legends of Tomorrow. And even if that was an aborted timeline, it's safe to say that Argus is pretty evil by this point. Renee has a confrontation with Dino, Roy, and Zoe, revealing that he's actually in on the bomb plan. And meeting with Global CEO, William flirts while Mia gets hold of his DNA. Using his DNA, Mia, William, and Connor make their way down to the sub-level, and in the lift, he finds out that his angel investor for his company was actually Felicity, meaning that she's kept her distance, but she's still had a hand in his life. 
The group lay the smack down on a few guards and discover Felicity, and after a standard I told you not to come, Felicity and William have a heartfelt reunion, while Mia criticises Felicity's willingness to put her work ahead of her family. Which is a standard Felicity versus Oliver argument. I, I didn't notice that on first viewing. William and Felicity run into Zoe, Roy, and Dinah, who have a brief catch-up with the team. Mia and Connor return to help after Connor straight-up plagiarises the With Great Power Uncle Ben speech. As they all arrive at the location, they expect to find the bombs in... Renee appears. Guess what? The bombs have been moved, and Kevin Dale of Eden Corpse or Galaxy One is a moustache-twirlingly evil human being, moving up his plan to preclude Renee's plans to evacuate the citizens of Star City before the detonation. They agree to trust Renee, and they go to the night's event with the team following in order to destroy the detonator. Mia stumbles upon Dale and follows him to his office, with him escaping while she absolutely destroys his henchmen. When she gets outside, she pulls off an astounding shot and successfully destroys the detonator. The day is saved. Unfortunately, Renee has to maintain his image by denouncing Roy, Diner, and Felicity as being the aggressors of the evening and the entire plot to blow up the city. Renee gets a bit of a talking to from Dale because it seems suspicious that the 2040 Team Arrow were able to find out where the bombs were and free Felicity on their own. Renee deflects, blaming the failure on Dale, and Dale reveals his plan to take the Archer program global as an anti-vigilante system. As Mia and Felicity wrap up with a chat about their feelings, Felicity admits to her that the Archer program is on her. And back in the present, we see Felicity bringing Archer online for the first time. I really enjoyed this episode. The action was a little uneven in places, and the whole scavenger hunt thing that got the future storyline to this point dotted around between interesting and painfully slow throughout the season. But I'm happy to admit it, if this has all been a setup for an Arrow 2040 spin-off focusing on Mia, William, and Connor when Arrow goes off the air, I'm totally all for it. I doubt it's going to happen, but I'd watch the shit out of it. Black Lightning, Season 2, Episode 16, The Omega. Gamby arrives to help Jennifer, and after a brief standoff with Lala, he's able to siphon off Jennifer's excess energy, and she's able to calm down with an in-her-head moment with Perenna and puts a stopper on her powers. Gamby is left badly burned, and Anissa arrives with Jefferson to confirm that Gamby is still alive, and Jennifer and Anissa return to the Sanctum with an unconscious Gamby while Jefferson looks for cues to where Tobias may have fled. Dr. Jace tries to kill Black Lightning, but gets brutally beaten down by Lynn when she arrives, Jace trades information about the four elemental metahumans working for Tobias in exchange for going into regular police custody rather than the ASAs, to which Jefferson agrees. Gamby wakes up, albeit badly injured, and Anissa goes out as Thunder to help quell the riots while Gamby and Jennifer restore power to the city. Gamby reveals that Tobias was correct in his assessment that Jefferson will be running low on power until the generators are restored. The teleporting matter that appeared briefly in a stinger earlier in the season kidnaps Dr. Jace from the prison after killing a bunch of police, and he allegedly takes her to the Markovians. Black Lightning and Thunder seem to have the upper hand against the fire and water matters, but then the ice and sound ones arrive to turn the tables, resulting in a powerless Jefferson being incapacitated by the fire matter alone, while Anissa is triple teamed by the remaining three. An unlikely hero arrives in Lala, who shoots the fire matter several times before leaving to find Tobias. When Jennifer melts the ice around the generator, Jefferson gets the power he needs for him and Anissa to easily dispatch the remaining three metas. Gutter and Tobias have an altercation that results in her leaving and him activating all of the pod kids. The ASA actually listen to Lynn and do not interfere with the children, who aren't violent, just dazed and confused. Gamby discovers where Tobias is and Jennifer and Anissa head out, while Jennifer follows, having learned that she can fly. Lala confronts Tobias, believing himself to be immune to Tobias's mental conditioning, but Tobias uses a new command to instantly manifest every single person he's ever killed as a new tattoo, which incapacitates him immediately. Jennifer comes in through the window, calling herself Lightning, and lassos Tobias, threatening to kill him. Jefferson arrives and talks her down, and they defeat Tobias together. At the ASA headquarters, Odell is revealed to have custody of the Truth Boy from earlier in the season, Windy Wendy, and most shockingly of all, Khalil all in pods. Tobias is fitted with a power-dampening collar and taken into custody at a metahuman black site called The Pit. So, obviously, the season ends with everything wrapped up with a neat little bow, right? No, the season ends with the Pierce family having dinner and Jefferson admitting that while he feels happy for his family are all around him, 
he feels guilty for the happiness and relative safety that his family enjoy, and often entertains the idea of up and leaving Freeland and all of its nonsense. As the family have a bit of a moment, Odell arrives announcing that he knows their secret, and that he is deputising them to fight against the coming threat from Markovia. As with the release of all the metahumans and the capture of Dr. Jace, Freeland will now be a battlefield for a war coming in the very near future. The season was, on the whole, much weaker than the first one. There were a few plot threads that just went nowhere, and this was one of the standout episodes. I can't help but think that it wouldn't have hurt to spread some of the love amongst the rest of the season, perhaps. Maybe improving on the penultimate episode a bit, since there was a lot to fit in within the runtime. Still, it's a decent end to the sophomore season for Black Lightning, and I do genuinely look forward to see what comes up in Season 3. The Flash Season 5, Episode 17, Time Bomb. I found this week's Flash episode to be a bit paint-by-numbers with the exception of the first and last few minutes. The gist is this. Our second Cicada Grace is out for revenge on the meta that killed her parents. Shocker, it turns out that that meta isn't a villain of the week, or even one of Team Flash having made some sort of mistake while saving the day elsewhere. No, it's a random accident from the first activation of a suburban mum's powers. She has the power of Fragokinesis, which is the ability to make things explode. She blew up an ATM and never came forward because she truly believed that nobody was hurt and that it was a victimless crime. Well, not quite. It turns out you appear to have manslaughtered two adults, leaving a young child orphaned. Whoops. Over the course of the episode, Vicky's family discover her abilities and are absolutely terrified. Now, usually I find this to be a strange thing in comics and superhero media in general. Why would your family suddenly be scared of you if you could run fast or lift things well or teleport? But yeah, if you can make things explode with the power of your mind and you can't control your power? Yeah, that's some legitimate fear right there. Anywho, Team Flash protect her from Grace when Orland steps in and tries to convince her to stop. She does for just long enough to impale him with his own dagger. Ouch. We're also introduced to the Starchives, which we're led to believe have been a thing all along, but it's essentially where they dump all of their tech that they don't keep immediately on site at Star Labs after a given crisis is over. This is how they work out that Grace has come from the future, as there are now two copies of Thorn's Time Sphere, uh, one from the present day, made by Cisco, and one presumably from the Starchives in the future. <coughs> Destroy the one in the present. A lot about what makes this episode secretly, and I do mean secretly, good, is that the implications of Grace being the hateful one. Orland's anti-meta bigotry was completely her powers messing with his head, and once she's not affecting him through their link anymore, he's a complete pacifist. And it's also where Team Flash's we can only cure the ones who consent strategy falls down, because the present day Grace is in a coma. And even if she were to wake up, she's a child who now has literally nobody. Her parents are dead, her uncle is dead, even the doctor that looked after her for months is dead. She can't consent, and nobody else can do it on her behalf. And future Grace's powers are something else. Cicada being feared as he always has has seemed a little off-kilter to me. He's powerful, sure, but the team have had multiple attempts to incapacitate him, breach his dagger to a different Earth altogether, take his powers, freeze him solid, or even run him to the pipeline during one of the times he's boomeranged his dagger miles away. It's so obvious that he couldn't possibly be a bigger threat than Thorn or Zoom that it's just silly. Grace, the real cicada, in addition to having all in stagger, is immune to mental manipulation, can mentally mess with others at the same level, can shoot lightning, generate a force field, fly, detect metahumans, block metahuman powers without the aid of the aforementioned dagger. It would almost be a shame if she were to be beaten this season, because this woman is leaps and bounds more dangerous than the Thinker or any speedster big bad so far, and I look forward, hopefully, to her not being ruined. Back to the episode, we have Cisco's dating life side story and its implications for his now very much telegraphed leaving of the team, but that's not what drew us into the episode in the first place. The book ends to this episode where Thorn realising that the timeline has changed and telling Nora to come clean to Barry about working with him and Nora being about to tell all, only to be interrupted by Sherlock, who outs her for himself. Now while this does make sense for Sherlock's character, it's still a bit of a shitty thing to do, given that she was clearly about to do it herself. As a result, Barry looks at her with utter and complete devastation and disappointment, and throws her into the pipeline with no hesitation. And honestly, why wouldn't he? He may have done that even if she'd told him herself. 
because if he's learned nothing else over his time as the Flash, it's that if Thorne is involved in any way, nothing is as it seems. Nora is a traitor somehow, in some way, even if she doesn't know it. And if she does know it, then Barry's right to assume that she's being used in yet another way that she doesn't even comprehend. So it wasn't quite the bombshell episode that the title would suggest, and honestly I feel like the Nora thing didn't need to be held off for yet another episode. But at least we're moving now, and the next episode will finally get to us dealing with the consequences and maybe getting some answers. Of course, with Godspeed coming into it, will there be time for answers? <sighs> Probably not. Summary. Well, this is just weird, isn't it? Supergirl has been my favourite two weeks running, and I feel kinda dirty, like I need a bath, right now. So uh, I guess the order is Supergirl, Arrow, Black Lightning, and The Flash. Ugh, sorry guys, I need to go, I don't feel too good. I've been Adam from Passable Media, oh Supergirl, please no. And we'll be back again soon.